what fools believe, that, of course, is a little sarcastic, <laughs> that statement. If you remember from last week, I pointed out that here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul the Apostle is giving us a contrast. It's a contrast between the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of God. And to be clear about this issue, the wisdom of the world is essentially life to the exclusion of God. Or to put it another way, it's an understanding and outlook on life that doesn't factor in God or God's truth. It's what we call today, in a word, secularism. Our country today, and I say this with deep regret, our country is in the grip of a secularistic mindset. Uh, Secularism is like leaven in the loaf of the USA, and it is permeating and affecting everything about our national life, and that is That is not good news. In fact, let me show you why. In the book of James, he points this out, this wisdom. And, of course, he's talking about the wisdom of this world. This wisdom does not descend from above. It does not come from God, in other words, but is earthly, meaning it comes from the earth realm based on what you see, you touch, you taste, you hear, you smell. It's sensual, and in effect, that means it's driven by the flesh, the urges of of the flesh. And then the bottom line is, as James points out, it's demonic. It's literally fostered and promoted and driven by the demonic realm of life. That's how dangerous the wisdom of the world is from a Christian perspective. Now, in contrast to this is the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God comes to us by revelation of God himself. Remember, our God is infinite in nature. We are finite. How does a finite being understand infinite? You you can't. So the only way we can understand an infinite God is if he reveals himself to us. And, of course, that's exactly what God has done. He has revealed himself to us in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament, his handiwork in Psalm 19.1. But then God also has revealed himself in a person, and that person is Jesus of Nazareth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, so that if you want to know what God is like, all you need to do is study Jesus. Look to the person of Jesus Christ. And then on top of that, God has given us even further revelation And it's this right here, the Bible. The Bible is the inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of living God, of the living God. This is God's message to humanity. God has revealed himself to us in Scripture. Now, also, remember this. The wisdom of God is always contrary to the wisdom of this world, or you could say it's antithetical to the wisdom of this world. And of course, the greatest example of this, as we saw last week, is the cross of Christ. The cross of Jesus, in spite of what humans may think on the surface without understanding the revelation of God, the cross of Christ is a demonstration of divine wisdom. One man wrote this, who would have thought that God would work through the scandal of the cross? 
That's a great question. Then he says, only God could demonstrate his power through a dying, powerless, and perceived criminal. Only God could do that. Only God could come up with the plan that is recorded in the Bible. No human being would ever conceive of it, I can assure you. Only God. And so here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians verse 18. This is the New Living Translation this morning. Paul says, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved. Now, remember something. Our salvation in Christ has three tenses. I was saved, I'm being saved, I shall be saved. I was saved, that's my justification. I am made right with God. I am being saved. We call that theologically sanctification. It's the ongoing work of God renovating our whole life. And then I shall be saved. That's called glorification when Jesus returns for his church in the great rapture event. So Paul says, we who are being saved, we know that the cross is the very power of God. And then in the next verse, verse 19, Paul quotes from Isaiah 29, 14. And here's what he says. As the scriptures say, I will, meaning God is saying, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. In other words, think of all the great intellects of of history. God says, I set them all aside. They have no, uh, no word. They have nothing to share with regard to how I work and uh, with regard to the plan that I'm unfolding. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, discard the intelligence of the intelligent. But then that brings up a question. Verse 20. So where does this leave the philosopher? Think of Nietzsche and Hume and uh, Plato and Socrates, all the great philosophers, Sartre, all of the great philosophers of history. Where does this leave them in light of the wisdom of God? The scholars and the world's brilliant debaters. Paul says, God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, and he does it through the work of the cross. And so back in verse 18 of chapter 1, Paul is saying that God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish through the message of the cross. Actually, the cross is a judgment on the wisdom of men. It's a judgment on human wisdom. And so Paul says again, look at this, the message of the cross is foolish. Uh, the word foolish comes from a Greek word, maria. Mar, maria is more how you say it, I guess. We get our word moronic or moron from it. <laughs> the message of the cross is moronic to those who are headed for destruction. Now, I should inform you that not everyone who's out there in this world looks at the cross in that way. But either way, they either look at it as moronic, foolish, or they pay it no mind. They just brush it aside. So Paul says they are headed for destruction. On the other hand, he says, we who are, again, being saved, know it is the very power of God. Wow. Wow. Now, by the way, I pointed this out before. In this text, Paul the Apostle is putting all of human life into one of two groups, into one of two categories. Those who are headed for destruction, category one. Those who are being saved, category two. And what determines the group that you're in depends on your view and your understanding of the cross of Christ. 
to the person who is headed for destruction, the cross is so much foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, we understand the cross means absolutely everything. It's where hope rises and life begins. It's where uh, everything good begins to flow out to mankind. We glory in the cross. In fact, Paul the Apostle put it this way in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. He says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. God forbid, by whom the world, the world and its wisdom is crucified to me. What that means is I am dead to the world and its wisdom, and the world is dead to me because they see me as an insignificant nobody. But I am dead to the world, and the world is dead to me because my glory is in the cross of Jesus Christ. You missed a good chance to say amen. All right. Shouldn't that be our testimony? Amen. Now, what I'd like to do for the next few moments is give you some thoughts about the cross I really want to drive this this concept more deeply into your consciousness, more deeply into your heart. And so I want to give you seven quick thoughts. We will call this the biblical view of the cross. Seven things, and I'll be quick. Number one, the cross of Jesus must be understood as a fact of human history. This is an event of history that has actually taken place in time. It's important to understand because you will hear people every now and then who say, how do you even know Jesus existed? Well, that is, that, if you hear that from someone, it, it's someone, unfortunately, who has never done their homework because there is plenty of evidence outside the Bible, extra-biblical evidence, to support the fact that there was an individual who grew up, uh, who had a very mysterious birth. He grew up in Nazareth. He was a carpenter, and at the midpoint of his age development, or at middle age, he began to lead a movement, and eventually he was put to death on the cross. Now, that is a fact of history. There is extra-biblical evidence as well as archaeological evidence that give credibility and support to this truth. Secondly, we must remember the cross itself is a bloody instrument of ruthless, horrible execution. In my thinking, this is probably the worst way that anyone could ever be put to death. In fact, if you remember the movie, The Passion of the Christ, very hard to watch. I have never watched it fully. It's just, for me, very difficult to watch. Um, It's interesting, I can watch violent movies, (laughs) like Private Ryan and, uh, you know, other movies, but I just, I don't know, I just can't, can't get through it. But you saw the brutality of that in the film, at least some of it I saw. It's like that. The, The event that happened was truly as brutal as it was portrayed, even more so if it could be. It was a horrible, ruthless, bloody execution. In my view, God allowed that to unfold because he is showing us the dark side of human nature. And he's saying in the event of the beating and the the brutality of the cross, God is saying to all all of us, sin is this serious. 
and the message that you hear in the gospel is that important. Never forget that. Number three, this is kind of a long one, but it's an important one. The cross is where God held court against all of us. I will not be at the great white throne court or the great white throne judgment because I've already been to court. All of our sins went to court and were judged in Jesus who became our substitute. He was bearing our sins and the judgment we deserved. He took it absorbed it all within himself. Divine justice was satisfied. In a word, this is what we call theologically propitiation. Remember that term? Paul, or excuse me, 1 John 4.10 says that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus, in our stead, satisfied the holy justice of God. And what that means then is this, in 2 Corinthians 5.19, for God was in Christ, Paul is speaking of the cross, he says, for God was in Christ reconciling, that is bringing back, making the, the doorway open, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And the reason why is because he already counted our sins against the person of Jesus Christ. And so God the Father is saying in the cross of Christ, the barrier of sin that, that uh, separated us has been totally removed, and the Father says you can come home. That's our message. We can say that to the world, to everyone and anyone. You can have a relationship with the king of this universe. You can come to him and have a relationship because the barrier of sin has been totally removed. Now that leads me to number four. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> number four, the cross of Christ is also a judgment on all of our human good. It destroys the illusion of self-righteousness. You see, everyone is going to stand before God in one way or another. And you will either stand in your own righteousness, self-righteousness, or you will stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's the idea. The cross destroys the illusion of self-righteousness. In fact, in Galatians 2.21, it says this. It says, if, if righteousness could come by religious rule-keeping, then Jesus Christ died for absolutely nothing. You see, there, the reason Christ died is because there wasn't any other way in, for human beings like us to have and to experience eternal salvation. When the best of men and women stand before God in their own righteousness, they are deserving only of the instant judgment of a just and holy God. The cross goes right to the root of human pride, cuts it out. We all stand at the same place, all of us. Before the cross, there is not rich, there is no poor, there is no black, there is no white, there is no, uh, you name it. We all stand before the cross in the same way. Number five, the cross is the key, the linchpin that releases to all, to us all, the grace of God. And remember, we've talked enough about this. Grace is all about blessing from God. And here's the truth. Grace is all that God is now free to do for us and in us because of what Jesus accomplished 
in our behalf upon the cross. So, so the cross then is the, the key, the linchpin that, that allows the dam of blessing to blow forth. It's, it's moved out. It's taken away so that God can pour the riches of his blessing. I like this acrostic, God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. I put the E in the word expense in red because it's so important that we remember, though it's free to us, it cost Jesus. It cost Jesus dearly. That brings me to number six. The cross of Christ is a visible demonstration of the great love that God has for us. And then I wanted to add, remember, no one took his life. He gave it freely, laying it down for us. He says that in John 10. No one took my life. No one takes my life. I lay it down of my own will. Freely, No one made him. Remember the old song, he could have called 10,000 angels. He didn't have to die. He chose because there was no other way for you and I to have salvation. So the cross then is the greatest visible demonstration of God's commitment and his love for all of us. I love this passage, 1 John 4, 9. God showed, that's the word. How much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, because we didn't, but that he loved us and sent his son as a, and the Greek word is propitiation, to take away our sins. In Romans 5, Paul wrote, While we, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us. Now, most people would be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Think about that. All the people in your life that you would be willing to die for. There are people, I'm sure. But I'll bet they're not your enemies. (laughs) I'll bet they're not the people that hate you or want anything to do with you. Look at this. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, while we were still rebelling, running, arguing, fighting back. That's when Christ died for us at the right time to demonstrate his love, to demonstrate, to show his love. You have to understand something. You cannot build a case for God loving you based on how much money is in your wallet. I hope you have a lot. I do. But that doesn't prove a thing. I hope you're not building a case for your love based on how healthy you are. Because you can lose that overnight. I mean, at the drop of the hat, you can lose everything. Your money, your health, your wealth, you can lose it all. What will you do then if you're in that place? How would you know that God loves you? You look back to the cross because there he took your place as your substitute. That's the one place, the one place where we fixate and focus on the fact that God has demonstrated his love for us once for all and forever. That leads me to the last thought. The message of the cross is a clear call to all of us. Its message is surrender your lives to God's wisdom in the truth of the cross. As Jesus said, look at this in Luke 9:23, if anyone wants to follow me, he must give up himself and his own desires. Why? Why is that important? 
because our own desires are deceiving and deceptive. They are based on issues that are not rooted and grounded in reality. So we need to turn away from our own desires. We need to give up ourself. Notice he says he must take up his cross. By the way, your cross is not your wife. You ever hear people say that? Well, my cross is that I have to work in such and such a place. Or my cross is my husband. Or my cross is... No. The cross is all about death. It's a place where you go to die. In, in the first century, whenever you saw a man carrying a cross going outside of the city, you knew that guy was going out to die. And, and he's using the cross in our lives as a symbol of death, that we are to come to him and die to ourself so that he can bring us to life, life like we have never experience. And so here's my summary then, and I wrote some things out that I want you to follow. The idea of wisdom is the lens or the basis by which you interpret, determine, and apply what is reality to your life. I hope that makes sense to you. As Christians, we interpret, determine, and apply reality or what is reality through the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ. So we look at everything through the lens of of the cross of Christ. Remember what Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives through me. In me, the cross is at the center of his life. Now, one more verse in 1 Corinthians. Paul said this in verse 21, Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, you could never know God by reading Plato or following Jean-Paul Sartre or, or Hume or any of the philosophers of history. They will never take you to God None of the great orators can convince you that you could follow them and find God. You cannot find God in human wisdom. It won't take you to God. It'll take you from God. So God, what's his answer? He has used our foolish, moronic preaching (laughs) to save those who believe the foolishness of preaching the Word of God. My last thing here, ask yourself this question. Do you believe in the Christ of the cross? Do you believe? The cross makes a judgment on human life. When we say we believe in the cross, We are admitting that God substituted himself because of our sin. The sinless one died in our place. The cross condemns my righteousness. It tells me that I am in need of a Savior. The cross declares that all my abilities, my intellect, and even my good works are deeply marred by sin and without any value in God's redemptive plan. The message of the cross is an offense to those who are in unbelief. And why? Because it destroys human pride. On the other hand, all those men and women who are being saved, the cross is the key that opens the gate to all of God's blessings. The cross is teaching us the way to experience God's forgiveness, healing, peace, purpose, and joy. Most of all, it's the one way to eternal life. 
through the cross of Christ. That thing that you wear around your neck sometimes, a cross, imagine if that were an electric chair on a golden chain. If, if, if it were, you would get more to the root of what we're talking about. We're just so used to it. We're just so used to a nice golden cross. It's an instrument of death. And God is saying to you, to, to me, come and die to yourself, and I will raise you back up in newness of life. Well, we're going to do communion, but I want you to take note of the invitation. Should I take communion? Communion is not for perfect people, but it's for people who are moving their life toward God and His grace. In fact, I want to be specific. As those of you who are going to help, you could prepare yourself. Let me read this to you. To all of you who truly believe in Jesus and the work of his cross, to those who sincerely repent of your sin and choose to live in love and peace with all men as possible, and who intend to lead a new life walking in God's holy grace, we urge you, draw near with trust and joy and take the sacrament to your comfort. Let it be a blessing to you as you make your honest confession to our great and almighty God. So would you pray with me and would you prepare your heart as a believer to participate in this? Lord, we pray that through the Holy Spirit you would Illumine our minds and our hearts. May we be made aware this morning of the, of the brutality, but also the beauty of the cross and what it means to all of us. It's the symbol of our redemption. We embrace it with all of our heart. We ask you to take the benefit of the cross, all the benefits, and through the Spirit, would you apply them to our lives? Make us rich in the benefits of the finished work of Christ. Prepare us, Lord, to participate. 